this one is going to be a little different than the one you just witnessed. So um, I, this is an updated actually uh, on a uh, lecture on uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We talked last time about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And before I go any further, I wanted to just clarify a terminology we hear all the time. Diastolic dysfunction, diastolic heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What's the difference? Why we keep changing terms? Diastolic dysfunction is a pure echocardiographic diagnosis. And you can hear stage one, stage two, stage three. That's what cardiologists like to put in their report. In general, stage one is asymptomatic, at least at rest, two and three. Whatever you hear, if you hear stage two and three, it's all asymptomatic until proven otherwise. It's more advanced diastolic heart failure. Now, if you move from diastolic dysfunction to diastolic heart failure, it's signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure uh, with or without elevated BMP and with some version, form of echo showing diastolic dysfunction. So it's more of a syndrome. However, American Heart Association to separate from diastolic heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, you have to exclude specific etiologies of diastolic dysfunction that we know. For example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That is a form of diastolic heart failure, but it's specific per se. Uh, valvular disease, constrict pericarditis. That's a syndrome of diastolic heart failure, but with a specific etiology. When you exclude all those specific etiologies that can cause diastolic dysfunction, a patient has signs and symptoms of heart failure, then you have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, head path, what we call it. So I hope that's clear. Uh, and, you know, just like uh, systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there are stages of progression according to American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. Stage A is risk factors for heart failure, for example, hypertension, age, diabetes, morbid obesity, uh, atrial fibrillation, stage B is asymptomatic uh, diastolic dysfunction. Usually it's an echo diagnosis that you send the patient for chest pain or some other things and you find that out. C is uh, B plus symptoms. D is progressive advanced uh, diastolic or uh, FF or diastolic heart failure, usually with a lot of severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and uh, I think the best is to approach, I have three patients. One is stage one, one is stage two, one is stage three. So hopefully you can get the whole thing. And, and this, you know, slide shows a lot of little details about the patient. That's actually how you get it every day. The key is I'm going to teach you through my glasses to extract what's really relevant for this particular patient in terms of diastology. So these are 75 years old women who was in previous uh, good, uh, good health, really no prior issues, maybe minimal or borderline high blood pressure, comes in heart failure clinic for four weeks of progressive shortness of breath associated with minimal exertion. Uh, her blood pressure is 150 over 90. Uh, she's a little overweight, 34 uh, um, BMI. Uh, uh, she has a little bit of peripheral edema. Uh, one thing that I do in the clinic when often patients come as well, I just have white coat hypertension. And, you know, just uh, then uh, what I do, I walk the patients a little bit. And then I get the pressure, blood pressure after. Why? Because true hypertension, you're always going to get much worse when, you, when they exercise particularly the diastolic. Sure, systolic always goes up with exercise, but diastolic should go down. It is a normal vasodilation. So with her, it went up to 160 or 105, and to me, this is not a white coat. You have something going on there. So keep that in mind. A little trick you can do quickly in the office. We do that with the exercise treadmill stress test. You know, send the patient for us. Chest pain, stress test. Don't ignore what blood pressure if they, we said it was hypertensive you know, uh, response to exercise. Kidneys are normal. X-ray is normal. EKG, a little LVH, uh, BMP, for somebody 75, you could say it's a little higher than normal, but it could be also normal. BMP does go up with age, it's a little elevated. Echo shows you mild ventricular hypertrophy when, when you order it. Ejection fracture is great, uh, a little imperial relaxation stage one. And I also report there mild enlarged left atrium, dilated inferior vena cava, normal right ventricle an estimated systolic PA pressure 45 50 will is pretty consistent with mild pulmonary hypertension. So the big question is, is this patient dysmia to the diastolic heart failure or is morbid obesity or just the condition because she's 75, she doesn't do much. And how do we sort all that out? So what kind of, we're going to go through definition of epidemiology of, uh, of uh, HEPF 
uh, diagnosis, pathophysiology, and treatment treatment of heart failure with preserved systolic function. But really, what I'm telling you is more of a actually pathophysiology and 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 also uh, treatment for diastolic heart failure syndrome because most of the time it's very rare when you just have an isolated patient we just have that you actually have the syndrome that you see either in the hospital or patient there you got to treat. So it's, it's the same. So who are these patients that we call them now? After we eliminate the specific etiologies like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, valvular disease, constrict pericarditis, where this patient who uh, have um, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So uh, this is the Olmstead uh, heart study. It's like the Framingham in Minnesota study that where Dr. Borlak and his colleagues from Mayo Clinic look in, in, into these patients and found that there are two kinds of subgroups. One is uh, patients who are older than 60, usually a median age about 76, uh, and those are about 90% of them. Uh, really, um, uh, they, uh, they are mostly women. Uh, they have history of hypertension, coronary disease, but usually single vessel, not the one that would cause you drop in injection fraction, uh, a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And then the other group, about 10% of them, are actually... Patients who have a high morbid obesity, high BMI, diabetes, and kidney disease. And as, try, as much as we try to say oh, this is a homogeneous population, a lot of times they're all together, right? But this is kind of patients that you suspect will be half path when you didn't find specific etiology. Uh, and uh, what particularly if you follow these patients on long term, uh, really they comprise now about over 50, half of all the patients who come now admit it for heart failure. Uh, the most of the more the 30 to 50 percent of mortality in this patient is actually not related to the actual heart failure per se. So you can imagine why clinical trials for these uh, patients with have PEF uh, have to begin with a very uh, lower chance of actually changing the outcomes just because half of the outcome are not related necessarily with heart failure. So in a nutshell, what I call this is non-cardiac heart failure. Just think comorbid illness related heart failure with the risk of oversimplifying. And I'm going to give you examples, and I'll show you how we can still take care of these patients while waiting for better outcomes. So just to make a point, uh, what is the most important factor suggesting symptomatic diastolic heart failure in these patients? Do you, you guys think it's the age and morbidity? I showed you the epidemiology. Theoretically, it should fit that. But is that the most important? Mild LVH on echo. Does everybody who have LVH on echo have diastolic heart failure? Mild increased left atrium, hypertension with exercise, enlarged left atrium dilated IVC, or all of the above? And the correct answer is all of the above are present in patients with hep -hep. The question is which one is the most sensitive here that no matter what will point you, this is real. And that's correct, only hypertension. In a way, actually, it makes sense. Left atrium is big, is one thing, but if everything, you know, goes back to your pulmonary artery and towards the right side, and uh, then maybe we're, we have a real, and there is no other explanation for pulmonary hypertension, maybe that's what's going on. That is correct, that's what the data show. I'm gonna show you the data. Uh, one thing for sure we report now on the echo is the left atrium volume index. It's probably the highest, uh, if you want, it's an anatomical BMP kind of that predicts elevated BMP, risk of AFib, risk of CVA, so stroke, hypertension, coronary release, related outcomes in heart failure, hospitalization, mortality, whether it's systolic or diastolic. So one, that's one index, but actually recently Mayo Clinic looked into this uh, a few years ago, and they tried to compare different of these factors, whether it's clinical versus echo structural uh, anatomy like ventricular mass index. And what they really found is probably by far the best uh, ROC curve was actually for the systolic estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure curve right ventricular systolic pressure, where we, how we report in the echo. And when you actually look and say, well, don't all patients with hypertension will have some pulmonary hypertension? And actually, if you look at the, all patients with uh, hypertension here, there will be in, in black line, uh, it really at most all patients with pulmonary hypertension will have, oh, I'm sorry, with isolated hypertension, they will have a systolic PA pressure in the 30, 35 or, you know, or less, nine, over 90% of them. And yes, some of them will have some form of hypertension, maybe up to about 8%. Maybe the, the condition that causes that will cause also pulmonary hypertension. But most of the patients with HEPPAF who have progressive pulmonary hypertension 
and in isolation, independent of hypertension. So keep that in mind. That's the, of course, that's the most sensitive. If you have other explanation for pulmonary hypertension, that's not going to explain it, but that's important. And as a matter of fact, you can re-stratify and look at the prognosis by just uh, looking at the systemic uh, PA pressure of more than 48 or less than 48, and that has significant prognostic value too. Um, and But there's another trick that you we can do in the cat lab, or you can do in your office, like I said, just exercise them, all right? In the cat lab, if we were resting to measure just the resting cardiac feeling pressure, they just they may look, most of them, just perfect normal, particularly they are eubolemic. The moment we lift up their legs or do a little stationary bicycle, immediately their pulmonary capillary pressure well, goes up. Well, with exercise, you see their blood pressure goes up and they get short of breath. So that's extremely sensitive. It actually reveals it even more sensitive than resting systolic PA pressure. And indeed, with exercise, the PA pressure goes even higher and it becomes even more important, uh, uh, more sensitive factor there. Uh, another particular thing about these patients with with with, uh, with the half path or diastolic heart failure who start exercising is uh, their cardiac feeling pressures immediately will go well, you know, up, but their oxygen delivery and extraction, when you measure it, what well, we do an exercise VO2, we should do those for patients who will undergo eventually heart transplant. Uh, they actually have very limited delivery of that oxygen. And with the price you pay, you know, those blood kind of gets stuck at the, at the periphery instead of keep flowing towards the tissue and 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 the cardiac feeling pressure goes up. So it is documented both in the cat lab, but also in during, you know, exercise. So keep that in mind. They look great at rest, but the moment you exercise them a little bit, if you can get some objective, you know, fact with his blood pressure, uh, whether by echo from your pressures or anything that will, uh, or if you are in doubt about their dizziness, send them to heart failure clinic, we can put them to an exercise VO2 and we can easily diagnose that and separate from other reasons of for shortness of breath. So let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology now. I hope it's clear so far. All right. And I'm not going too fast, although I do need to go fast because we've got a lot of slides. So you guys are smart, young, so we'll keep going. Um, in general, the way I like to approach this, because of course you cannot stop but making an analogy with the systolic heart failure, right? Or half rep. There is always a substrate, right? The heart itself, and there whatever damage is to the heart. And then there is also a trigger for decompensation. And we do that with systolic heart failure too. All right. So let's try to separate those two. And and why is that important? Because here the crying substrate. In, uh, for somebody with diastolic heart failure or HEPF will be stiff heart and stiff arteries, okay? At least that's the main idea. For whatever reason, we have reduced compliance of the whole system, arteries and, and, and heart, uh, uh, that will elevate the cardiac feeling pressures with minimal increase in volume, and I'll show you the data. For HEPF, will be heart gets a hit, you start to lose your ejection fraction or myocardial reserve, that's when the cardiac feeling pressure go up. Uh, so that's important. And then the other part is the trigger for the compensation. You know, when I report to you on the echo, well, there's mild event hypertrophy or mild left atrium enlargement or moderate or moderate, you know, or severe concentric hypertrophy, it takes usually to get to the LVH takes at least 10 years, even when you see it on the EKG. In other words, this has been going on for a while, but patients are decompensating only from time to time. As a matter of fact, that's what makes them come in the hospital and more and more frequent decompensations eventually they'll you know, also have uh, a mortality then in advanced stages is similar to just like systolic heart failure. So uh, what are the usual dec triggers are non-cardiac most of the time, like it happens also with a half rate, but it's a little more particular. Uh, really, the diastolic heart failure is way more sensitive to the volume overload than probably the systolic heart failure. Uh, hypervolemia usually is you know, the main cause, and often I'm going to keep pointing out if uh, you have a patient that is compensated with a diastolic heart failure, that means the ejection factor is over 50% and does not explain why the patient is in heart failure, always look at the kidneys, all right? It's more, it's not so much of a cardiorenal syndrome, it's renal cardiac syndrome, until proven otherwise. For whatever reasons, can you get a signal, let's start retaining salt and water, you know, you can get basal constriction and increase afterload too, but look there, okay? 
Uh, and then, yeah, it could be issues with uh, a, anything that changes the heart rate dramatically, where it's bradycardic, tachycardic, this patient will decompensate, ischemia, diabetes, and probably the most common cause after volume is actually sepsis. Even a simple UTI can put them uh, into that. So, um, as I mentioned, if I were to look at these curves, it's more of a Laplace log curve as opposed to Frank Starling curve that we see in half rep. You know, these patients, if you were to look at their volume versus wedge, you know, patients start to exercise or healthy people will have both resting and and, and uh, exercise. Uh, living and diastolic pressure just goes up a little bit, but doesn't really go much higher than 18. Uh, if you get higher than 18, that means you're just out of shape for what you're doing. All right. And then you stop. But patients who have diastolic heart failure or have PEP, their resting may look 10, 12. And that's why the echo report may come back with normal cardiac fitting pressures. The moment they move immediately, they will, you know, their wedge goes up 25, 30. So that's abnormal. Or if we were to plot this as a volume versus a uh, pressure curve, if this would be the compliance curve for this patient. You know, the patients, you know, a, a normal compliance curve looks something like this. I'll show you, right? I can increase a lot of volume in this patient. They say, me and you, we get in the hospital with appendicitis. What happens? They flood us with fluid, 5, 10 liters to maintain the blood pressure. Uh, but we can tolerate that just fine because our heart is very compliant and vessels and accommodate all that fluid when the surgery and everything is done, then the kidney will remove the rest. And I was able to do that at the price of increased volume, intravascular volume without necessarily going heart failure. But patients who has the same, you know, appendicitis or sepsis and, you know, their volume goes up because we got to apply the resuscitation protocol, immediately they will shift from this part of the curve where they were before this happens to this side where heart is stretched stiff and increase a little increase in volume suddenly high increase in you know, LVDP. So we want basically the trigger will move them up here. If we can move them back here, and again, if you see the absolute requirement is volume, <laughs> then it's easy. So, um, and, and this was the, the fact that these hearts are stiff, and actually I always should say heart and vessels are stiff and uncompliant has been demonstrated, you know, back in New England Journal by Dr. Zhao a, a long time ago. And you see, this is a normal compliance curve for somebody who's healthy, you can push the intra, you know, the volume in the left ventricle uh, up to 120, no issues, the pressure minimal goes up. If you have a, sti a rigid stiff heart, this is a compliance that will go along with that. The, a little volume that's increased immediately, the uh, living can diastolic pressure goes up. So that's what we know. All right. So what is the consequence of that? If you keep, um, you know, remember this, their curve is much steeper then patient will not tolerate minimal fluctuation in their volume status when they retain for whatever reason. That's one thing. So those hearts are volume dependent or heart and heart arterial system. The second thing is as that they won't tolerate, you know, I know these are some pressure volume loops that you really don't see it, but the bottom line is the difference, if you were to read these guys, this is uh, end systole, this is end diastole, so this is volume. So you see stroke volume, how big is here if you were to subtract from this, this. The wider this is, the bigger the stroke volume. If you suddenly increase the blood pressure in the afterlife of this patient, you see how the stroke volume gets more and more. But not only that, but the living curve pressure and diastolic pressure, all this occurs, suddenly shifts vertical, way higher pressure at the end of diastolic. So increasing the volume will decompensate this patient. Increasing the afterload is going to decompensate these patients. That's just to keep in mind things like hypertension with age 75, 80, you develop aortic stenosis. They'll have that you know, problem. And the opposite, decreasing the afterload too much actually can cause sepsis. Why? And the sepsis will cause tachycardia, right? So if it causes tachycardia, my diastole filling is already you know, small and I compensate by increasing the duration of diastole. So suddenly I'm going to have a shorter diastolic filling. And, and there will be less preload, therefore there will be less cardiac output. And these patients actually, if you try to exercise them, uh, while they may have higher resting heart rate, if you exercise them compared to a normal, uh, they really can't increase their heart rate. This is a control that, you know, for a given exercise, heart rate keeps going up until you reach your, you know, predicted uh, according to your age. But patients with HEPF have actually chronotropic sufficiency with exercise, which makes it so they can't really go higher than 110, 120, or 130, which would be 150 for somebody else. So that's one thing. Uh, 
Uh, and also another thing that happens with exercise, we're actually supposed to get vasodilation. So we should have a endothelial dependent vasorelaxation uh, uh, to increase the blood flow to the skeletal muscle, reduce the SVR, allow the blood flow to move and deliver more oxygen. That's not the case in patients with hepax or diastolic heart failure. They have microcirculatory problems and their SVI actually goes up. So that's another reason why with exercise, their afterload goes up and, and they're going to have issues. They're, they're diastolic shorter, so they're going to elevate their LVDP. All right? Uh, so consequence. What's the consequence on that? For a patient that I see, uh, uh, patients will not tolerate the infections. Remember, any tachycardia response, they're not going to do well. Uh, arrhythmias, uh, anything that changes the diastole too short, whether you have severe bradycardias or you have severe tachycardias, uh, and anything that will change the afterload, they'll make it higher, low cardiac output. So now, uh, I thought before I go any further, you, I, I got to educate you a little bit about what do we mean by diastolic dysfunction when you read that echo report, stage one, stage two, stage three. The purpose is not for you to memorize any of this, okay? The purpose is for you to actually look at this classic hemodynamics curves. What we try to do is to estimate non-invasively what's the relationship in the, in between the left atrial pressure and left ventricular pressure to create, to push the blood into the left ventricle. And if you look here at the early diastole, which occurs right after the T wave, the, you have a rapid uh, uh, deceleration here and, and relaxation of the left ventricle. The aortic valve closes, and, we, uh, and then as soon as the left ventricle pressure gets lower than the left atrial pressure here, it creates this three millimeters mercury mean gradient that has a certain duration. Ideally, you want to list, you know, half of diastole. And it's this little three millimeters mercury that drives all the blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle, ideally at least 70, 80 milliliters, that then is available to be pushed out as a stroke volume. And if you have imperial relaxation, imagine that this slope is slower. For whatever reason, heart relaxes slow. Could be age-related, could be adrenaline uh, and vagal mismatch, it, uh, medication, sepsis, it doesn't matter. If this slows down, okay, then the point of this the ventricular pressure getting higher, the left atrial pressure is later and later, okay, so then this mean gradient is going to be shorter and smaller, and it's going to lead to less, instead of having two-thirds of filling in early, early diastole, most of the filling will not occur in early diastole. It will have to occur in late diastole when the left atrial pressure is very high, and you're waiting for left atrium kick to push that extra blood that was there. And as long as the asphalt is long enough, these people do just fine, even with relaxation stage one. But if your diastole shortens for whatever reasons, you know, when I exercise, you want to, uh, you know, you have infections, you get tachycardia, you got a little flu-like illness, bronchitis, UTI, you, gout, you name it, then immediately their diastole is insufficient. You're not going to be able to empty blood in from the left atrium and diastole at the end of diastole, like to compensate for imperial relaxation and imperial filling in the early, so that you're going to have elevated pressure, they're going to be short of breath. Okay, so rest good with the stage one. With any trigger or challenge, they can be short of breath. Okay, and that's what I like. And in general, on the echo, you won't see much except we tell you imperial relaxation. You won't see a necessary big left atrium, you won't see a necessary left ventricular hypertrophy, just that's just a stage one, nothing else there. No elevated cardiac feeling pressures. So for this particular patient, substrate, it's it's got imperial relaxation. That means there's some uh, anatomical or biochemical substrate. It's been going for a long time. Why would this patient come in the hospital with short, you know, shortness of breath or to your clinic? Well, something happened. So what did our particular patient have? When we exercised her blood pressure 160, 100, that was unrecognized high blood pressures contributing. To your show, she also has peripheral edema. So just two of those factors. Chronic volume overload, even if it's a low, and blood pressure going up. And the, they go together. When the volume goes up, you know, sift arterial and arteries and a heart system, you're going to have more blood pressure too. So this particular patient, I, I, I definitely have to put them on a list of low, some diuretic. And then I like to control the blood pressure, you know, gentle for somebody's old with certain, you know, goals. Try to get that diastolic blood pressure below 85. Systolic, you know, it's controversial, but for elderly, 140, 150s, we don't have to panic. If it gets way more than 180, I would like to drop it better, you know. But don't try to drop it too much to 120. 
because a lot of them, that will be below their renal perfusion pressure and they'll get uh, kidney issues. And then I can't really directly get her out of diastolic heart failure, so go gentle. So these patients, because they have excellent otherwise heart reserve, they are tachycardic, particularly on the exercise, they'll do well with the beta blocker to keep diastole long, get them volume, get the volume down. So a little bit of basically uh, thiazide or chlorothiazide. If, if there's a lot of volume, you can use furosemide temporary. Uh, you work on the periphery. You know they do well with you know amlodipine, dihydropyridines. You can use an AC inhibitor too. Just remember they are mild. They are really not even if you max them out, won't treat well the blood pressure. Often these patients are symptomatic. You need to use a calcium channel block on top of some amana one. And, and a better blocker mostly to keep the diastole with the heart rate somewhere. You don't want to be 60 or below like you were to treat active ischemic coronary disease. You want to be 60 to 90 when they exercise. You want to make sure they are able to go up with their heart rate. Okay. And this is basically our patient. This is a healthy version. This is our patient right now is here. After I get the fluid down, you know, I diarise them a little bit, put them, treat their blood pressure. We get them here. If we can keep them here. They can live for a long time. They don't have to come to the hospital, nor in the clinic, nor they have that high mortality that's uh, at the end of disease, okay? Uh, so if I were to keep going through those, you know, diastolic I was telling you about, again, you don't need to know this part, but you do need to know this. If you look just at the shape of this curve, this is the left ventricular in the, you know, diastolic pressure. This is the left atrial pressure. Notice that normal are somewhere in the 10 range, 5 to 10 range here. Everything occurs between 10 and 15. And with higher and worse and worse diastolic dysfunction, this is stage 1, this is stage 2, this is stage 3, then all the cardiac filling pressure, left atrium, left ventricle, are the higher you know, level, close to 30s by the time you get to stage 3 or restrictive physiology. So, of course, you understand why they are short of breath at rest. Here, they may be only with exercise. Here in general, they are at rest or minimal exercise. And here, they're definitely at rest, class four heart failure. All right. And that's what we try to tell you. Now, how do I tell you from that report? I just, or well, instead of just telling you stage one, stage two, stage three, what does that mean? Well, in stage one, you have mostly just in relaxation and there won't be nothing wrong with the anatomy. Look for the buzzwords when I say elevated pressure, whether it's elevated LA pressure, that's on the left side. Elevated pressure on the right side, elevated RA pressure, IV inferior vena cava dilated, no respiratory variation, pulmonary pressures being high, mild, moderate, severe. Those are indexes that that heart is functioning under high pressure, whether it's just increased afterload, valvular issue, or increased preload. Okay, all right, and that's important. And here I'm showing you that really true when you go to stage two, I'm going to report lots more with structural abnormalities. I'm going to report left ventricular hypertrophy or art, right ventricle being big and dilated, although initially the functions could be normal. And then at the really end stage, I'm going to call everything you can imagine. So it sounds like it's all but short of ejection fractures, 10%. Okay? All right. And somebody with cardiac amyloidosis would be a diastolic heart failure, right? Not necessarily have PEF. I would say hyperechoic myocardium, bright, you know, speckled pattern suggestive of infiltrative cardiomyopathy. There will be lots more of true anatomy issues once you get to stage two and three. Stage one, I may report nothing left eight except in relaxation. Okay? So I hope that helps you to understand, translate when you read our echo report. Okay. So now let's go through some a patient with stage two diastolic you know, dysfunction. So stage two, what we call it pseudonormal, uh, that's a term more for cardiologists because it looks like normal. Don't worry about pseudonormal. That's just the same like stage two. But stage two, uh, you know, diastolic dysfunction, meaning it's a woman similar like the other one, similar age, hypertension. Uh, this time we have more comorbid illnesses. So you can say there is hypertension, there is prediabetes, morbid obesity is not just a somebody who looks otherwise healthy obese and just has unexplained shortness of breath. So you're going to see, just like I'm going to report on my echo, lots more structural stuff, you're going to see lots more comorbid illnesses. They are clear. Goal of therapy is independent, even if we didn't know about the shortness of breath and the head path. So this is, well, you know, patient is on thiazide, is on, you know, it's got also paroxysmal AFib. Paroxysmal AFib always comes with OSA, morbid obesity eventually, and, 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 uh, and uh, head path. Once blood pressure is 170 or 80, so 
Typically, elderly kind of is more of a systolic hypertension. Heart rate is 55. Uh, remember, this patient has chronic drop insufficiency. Either their heart rate is too low, but they also cannot go back too high. Um, not much of a right side pressure seems to be okay. BMI is high. It's got periphery edema. It's got sick, uh, chronic kidney disease, stage 3. He's got what uh, a uh, endocrinology will call pre-diabetes. Uh, and I know I'm not an endocrinologist. That can that means I can afford to say anything I want. I hope one day we drop this idiot term as pre-diabetes. There is no such thing as pre-diabetes. What is pre-diabetes, right? Can you be a bit pregnant or more or less pregnant? You are either pregnant or you're not pregnant, right? Because if you follow these patients with pre-diabetes for the, another 10 years, 99% get diabetes. All it means, remember glucose is a homeostatic variable, is the last to change. So if you win that, we wait for that to change, unless you do a glucose tolerance test, which nobody ever does it, that doesn't tell you anything. This I would call this is full-blown diabetes type 2 that requires lifestyle changes, it requires diet, doesn't necessarily require medicine. Maybe we have some metformin that can help with that. But I think if you talk the patient and the doctor acts accordingly, you have diabetes, let's start working on it so you don't develop the diabetes that causes insulin then that makes a difference, right? Has insulin, when you are full-blown full diabetes, let's assume this patient progresses to type 2 diabetes that requires insulin. Has insulin as a therapy for type 2 diabetes ever showed any change in the cardiovascular outcome? The answer is no. Has lifestyle changes, including diet and losing weight, plasma as metformin, have they changed and I you know the cardiovascular outcome. The answer is yes. So let's go back and call it diabetes, not pre-diabetes. Not you don't have it, you almost have it, but every year it sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. That's my take-home message. Why? Because I see the patient after they develop the problem. And I know I can't fix that unless you know somebody who sees the patient early or fix that. I know this is a little diversion but I'm getting into what's diastolic heart failure, is the heart failure of comorbid illnesses. A cardiologist cannot fix this. It's only a primary care physician, a family medicine doctor, or an internist who has seen the patient for years and years and worked together and knows the patient to commit them for lifestyle changes. They would make the difference. That's why I'm saying that. All right. So now let's go back to uh, our business. We have EKG. Uh, so this patient's pre-diabetic, we have CKD stage 3, but we don't know what's causing that, all right? Uh, we have, could be high blood pressure, could be the pre-diabetes. Uh, we have a BMP that's clear elevated now. We have LVH, more or closer to moderate. Stage 2 diastolic dysfunction, the systolic pulmonary pressure is in moderate high now, so everything, and you have also that elevated both the left atrial pressure and the inferior vena cava is dilated. So now we have the same patient like the other one, more comorbid illnesses, more elevated cardiac pressure, obviously sicker. Uh, and if I were to go here, I just want you to focus on this little guy. See, now it looks like we reestablished most of the blood flow from the left atrium and left ventricle and diastole early in diastole because now the left atrial pressure has been permanent high and it can reestablish to be higher the left ventricle pressure. So blood is pushed again in early diastole. But this patient has chronic volume overload and it's chronic with probably class 2 to 3 New York Heart Association heart failure. On the echo, you're going to see more structural abnormalities, left ventricle hypertrophy, right ventricle getting big, other things, and organ damage, what I call on echo. All right? And now we are here. And yes, the heart has been proven to be also stiff, stiff heart, stiff arteries. The left atrium gets big in this stage. Now, if we were to separate again the uh, structural heart part, right, from the uh, triggers, okay, I want to work on both of them, all right? Uh, can I fix the LVH? We have data for that. We have some, let's say, if hypertension causes LVH. We have actually some reverse remodeling studies. It takes about three to five years, but right now that doesn't matter for the patient, right? <laughs> so, so I suggest focus on the trigger the same way, like we said before, because it's more and more important that actually investing everything in the trigger to fix it is more relevant to the patient to get them out of the hospital or avoid hospitalization 
and improve functional status. Remember, a lot of them are elderly. For them, what it matters, they don't want to be in the hospital. They just want good quality of life. So more important than how long they live. So this patient absolutely needs to be diuresed, often a loop diuretic, until you normalize the volume status. It's functional on the right side. Then treat the blood pressure. If there is this patient, in terms of think heart rate, is this heart rate what I want it for him? So it's 50. Do I want it at 50? Theoretically, you have a prolonged death, or it should be good. There is a catch. If you have that preload there, whatever goes in early in diastole, if that stroke volume or preload is high enough, then the heart rate of 50 will be good enough. But is this patient is short of breath, all right? How do I, and the, so if that uh, preload becomes limiting, the stroke volume gets, gets smaller than what the body needs, then the only way how the uh, body can compensate is by increasing the heart rate. So actually these patients, once you get to stage two and three, they need higher heart rate to compensate for less blood flowing in diastole from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So this patient, actually, if she's short breath, I would actually increase, because I got a pacemaker, I'll increase temporary the heart rate maybe to 70. I'll make sure we turn on what we call the rate response. That means when she walks, uh, the, the pacemaker will see that she's breathing faster and will allow the heart rate to pace a little faster to 100. And I think those things can increase the cardiac output and then help reduce cardiac pain pressures. We can work with the electrophysiologist, with the cardiologist. Uh, and yes, I will treat the blood pressure. Uh, there is a caveat. Somebody who's been diabetic for at least 10 years, particularly if they have autonomy insufficiency or CK, uh, chronic kidney disease from diabetes with proteinuria, careful not to drop that blood pressure too much. Yes, you don't want the diastolic to be over 85, but you don't want the systolic to go way below 125. Why? Kidney, like the brain, regulates their own perfusion pressure. So after 5, 10 years of very high blood pressure, systolic over 160, as soon as you drop that systolic below 120. We have data, the ACCORD trial and some others, there are two or three more now, they showed you that if you overtreat the blood pressure in these patients with diabetes and hypertension, you actually get acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, hypotension, and I can't diarrhea the patient, get the volume out, so I get them out of diastolic heart failure. So have a more gentle and more uh, you know, realistic goal. Systolic, you want to be around 140. Diastolic, you want to be below 85. Keep it there. Don't go way below 130, okay? All right, so hope this is useful. And again, if the patient is a pacemaker, work with the arrhythmia clinic so we tune up better the pacemaker. And at the end of the day, I get them out of this decompensation, but I need to treat if there is diabetes, weight loss, sleep apnea, big one, particularly more with these patients. So that's what you got to do. Keep convincing them, motivating them to go and go through that part. Okay. Any questions about this stage? All right. So stage three, stage three is the patient that we see in the hospital, often in the ICUs. And pretty much everything is abnormal with this patient except the rejection fraction, okay? So you have a 42 years old African-American, this is a younger, but it's morbidly obese, uh, has history of diastolic heart failure, hypertension, and diabetes. You see, almost I cannot say diastolic heart failure without diabetes and hypertension. All right, so it's the heart failure of comorbid illnesses. It's a non-cardiac heart failure, once again. Why? Because I can focus as much as I want on the heart. I'm not going to get this patient out of trouble. Sure, heart is part of why the patient is decompensating, why he's in the hospital, is suffering. But the main issue is outside the heart. I need to focus on that. Okay, so it was discharged from the heart for recently from the hospital for respiratory failure from hypertensive urgency. He has bilateral pleural effusions, uh, has diastolic congestive heart with an ejection rate 65, type B, this type 2, uh, complicated by right toe first amputation. If I were to tell you that the patient has diabetes and it's got the first toe amputated, how advanced is that diabetes? I call it end stage. And I will explain to you why it's end stage. I'm not talking about some trauma or minor accident that evolved that. I'm talking about, you know, diabetic neuropathy, the extra. If you were to listen to a podiatrist talking about the prognosis of these patients on a large scale, okay, 60, they, by, uh, uh, by six months, their mortality or morbidity is 50%. I call that end-stage diabetes, okay? And that tells you what's going on. Every organ has been damaged or ruined by, this, by diabetes for this patient, uh, except the heart because ejection fracture is 
and yet the patient's in the hospital for acute decompensated heart failure. All right? That's why the cardiologist cannot help you here. Sure, I can get the blood pressure down, doesn't get a stroke, but that's not going to help get him out of. So this patient has incident CKT stage 4, diabetic nephropathy with proteinuria, atrial fibrillation, multiple cardioversion. Again, atrial fibrillation is an innocent bystander. Let's get activated eventually. It makes things worse, but it's not the cause. Sleep apnea, not on therapy. It's in the ICU uh, in, in, uh, in respiratory distress. I we were called to manage the diastolic heart failure. You know, over 50 pounds fluid overload, we estimated his patient is on 100 max oxygen, non repeater about to go on the, uh, on the breathing machine, basically, on ventilator, large pleural effusion. Blood pressure is 198 over 104, heart rate is 100. Um, uh, creatinine is 3.2, obvious. Notice it's mostly the creatinine, not so much the BUN, so that means speaks for true progressive uh, chronic kidney disease. It's got almost nephrotic range proteinuria, uh, hemoglobin C is 12.7, sugar is not controlled, PMP is 500. Notice for somebody who's about to die because of congestive heart failure, the BMP is just low elevated and the same, the ejection factor is normal. And echo shows severe LVH and elevated LA pressures uh, with restrictive physiology, all right? Uh, so what do we do with, for this patient? Do you think we got him better or not? Sounds pretty ominous, right? All right, so. Okay, all right. So but basically, I, I, the, I agree with you. The, the goal here is aggressive volume removal. It doesn't matter how. So we try with, obviously, with, with a creatinine of three and a half. It's only so much. We tried furosemide trip. We got a little bit off. It wasn't enough. We actually did ultrafiltration, moving in CCU. We remove about you know, uh, five to six liters every day. In three days, he was euvolemic, and creatinine stayed the same, 3.4. Then we treat the blood pressure separate to the little nifedipine. They need, when they have this advanced kidney disease, you are not going to get away with mild antihypertensive. So we uh, we, uh, we we added some nifedipine, some carbidolol for better blockers, didn't tolerate the ACE inhibitor, got hyperkalemia, and he went home, and he was fine until end up, and unfortunately due to poor compliance, uh, uh, getting it uh, the gravy and eventually end up on dialysis and then uh, passed away from some infection. But yes, you can get, of course, we just temporize. But if I don't fix his diabetes, I don't work on the other style lifestyle, it's not going to get better. But yes, you can get them better. Here, I just want to show you, so in, re in restrictive physiology, you see this, all this, the LA pressure gets huge, everything that 30. And, you know, even if you try to get more, uh, uh, more uh, blood flowing from the left atrium and left ventricle and only diastole because the left ventricle pressure gets higher and higher. It shuts down the left atrium uh, no matter what. So that's what's called restriction. The pressures are so high in the left ventricle, nothing can come from the left atrium. So nothing comes in diastole, nothing will come, you know, go out in systole. That's restrictive. And often you're going to have all kinds of structural abnormalities. Also, the right side of the heart will be involved, dilated in fear of an archival. Let me show how it looks. This is an inferior van cover from the subcostal view. Anything over 2.2 centimeters dilated. And you see, you see red flow here. So the, basically, this is where we have our, our, our Doppler. So if it's red, that means the blood goes away from the heart into the liver. And that means nothing goes into the heart. The pressures are so high. So pay attention when you see those little buzzwords on the echo report. Now, there are clinical correlates for that. A JV jugular venous pressure up to the earlobe. So make sure you look at the earlobe. You don't miss that. That will be the same. Early satiety, when they eat smaller and smaller portion, they are full. That tells you the right side pressure, the extremely average. Usually the right atrial pressure will be in the 20 millimeters mercury range. And of course, we can measure the, usually you get to moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension. And that's important for who? It's important once your right atrial pressure is about 15, 20 millimeters mercury. We have data showing that the right atrial pressure predicts the development of acute kidney injury or progressive renal failure in somebody who's admitted with hospital. So basically, if your right atrial pressure is close to 20, the ear lobe I was telling you, the IVC dilated systolic flow reserve, 80% uh, injury, uh, acute kidney uh, failure in the hospital. If you have that right atrial pressure stays normal, it's below 10%. All right, so that's extreme. Why? Because you got the renal veins, they drain into the right atrium. 
normal the right atrial the, brain, uh, the renal vein pressure is about five millimeters mercury higher than the right atrial pressure. So if the right atrial pressure gets 20, then the renal vein pressure will be 25, 30. That means the renal arterial pressure doesn't change. As a matter of fact, it gets uh, lower from the uh, inappropriate vasoconstriction from neuronal activation. So that pressure gradient that drives the the renal blood flow and function is going to get the GFR is going to get smaller and smaller, and you activate renal angiotensin, and then you basically cause uh, acute on chronic renal failure. So, and what happens if I get then acute kidney injury? The kidney will refuse to diuresis, will retain more salt and water, will aggravate the diastolic heart failure, pushing it on the wrong side of the compliance curve. That's bottom line. Okay, so this particular patient. Uh, hypervolemia once again becomes even more important, but also hypervolemia is refractory to therapy because I have kidney issues here. That's the main issue. So this patient is staying up here, probably, you know, for a long, long time, and is staying up there. I can't get it back here because I don't have good kidneys. If I have good kidneys, I can easily swing them back. So if not, often it's only when they get on dialysis that you're able to normalize the volume that their heart failure gets better. All right. Uh, so that's extremely important. And basically, this particular patient is often, I would like for you not to pay so much attention to my restrictive physiology, what we call diastolic heart failure, we call it HEPAP. Get away from the heart. Just look at the rest of the big picture. Look at the kidneys. If I were to pick an organ between the heart and the kidney, which one really is worse here? I got the GFR less than 20%, patient's about to go on dialysis. This is a renal cardiac syndrome. So you're going to always see diastolic heart failure of anybody who has got a GFR that's less than 20% because they can't match their volume and the blood pressure and everything. This comes from the kidney. So it's a renal cardiac. This is managed better by kidney doctors. Of course, the cardiologist can help you with, you know, intermittent diuresis, blood pressure control, but really it's what, you know, kidney issues and also what's causing that. If diabetes is not controlled or any other issue, obstructive uropathy, big one and elderly, uh, you know, then other little infections make things temporarily worse for the kidney and you get into trouble, all right? So we, how about we talk a little bit for last, you know, five, 10 minutes about treatment. What do we know? Evidence-based medicine, how to approach these patients, okay? Well, uh, according to the, uh, the original 2009 guidelines for uh, diastolic heart, American Heart Association, NCC, they say, well, we really don't have much to change the evolution, but we have, we learned the triggers are important. So the number one goal is to treat the trigger for the compensation. Now, American Heart Association and guidelines does not talk about the trigger. I use this term and I separate just for convenience of presenting and easy to remember that. There is a substrate, there is a trigger. And find out the trigger, you fix the trigger, the substrate doesn't almost matter. And that's what matters right now. Now, if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the substrate does matter. You will need a heart transplant eventually, right? If you have amyloid, the substrate does matter. That's why we have the diastolic heart rate. But if they have PEF or other things, you know, we, you know, things will move in the right direction. So decongest volume is number one, control the afterload, uh, preserve the kidneys, no matter what, get the kidneys good. Why? Kids are not good. My volume and blood pressure are not good. So then we go back to where it was. And then maintain, look at the heart rate. You don't want to be too low, too high. Inappropriate bradycardias from OSA is a problem. Inappropriate tachycardias, AFibs and or SVTs are a problem too. All right. And there are little things, infections, diabetes, anemia, treat the comorbid illnesses. Be aggressive with comorbid illness even more than otherwise somebody who just has an isolated iron deficiency, anemia. And we have data for that. Having said that, if you look at all randomized clinical trials, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, ARBs, digoxin, really the, each of them isolated did not show to improve survival. And I, I know I'm going to bore you. We do have one positive light at the end of the tunnel for spironolactone. The top cat trial was positive for reduced hospitalization, but negative for mortality or neutral. Uh, it doesn't mean it was worse. It's just neutral. Okay. And uh, and you say, well, is that important? Well, if my patients are 42 years old, I would like to see improvement in mortality, right? Those are 10%. But my patients are 75 or 80. For them, just staying out of the hospital and being functional, it's an extremely important goal. So I think, yes, it's very useful, okay? And uh, here I show you, uh, this is a nice 
uh, <clears throat> image because it shows if you look at the progression of diastolic heart failure, uh, really the mortality and the prognosis keep, you know, gets worse and worse with the comorbid illnesses. So if I were to separate the diastolic heart failure guys that we can live and never die from heart versus the diastolic heart failure or hep peps who are going to have very high poor prognosis just like the ones with low ejection fraction, then really renal dysfunction and comorbid illnesses are the single most important. And a lot of this, what we call 30-50% mortality is related to the comorbid illnesses and the cardiologist cannot treat that. This is a patient who will be very frustrated with the family, will bounce back and forth between the cardiology, primary care physician, you know, diabetes specialist, kidney doctor, and nobody's going to take, you know, control. But okay, this is what we need to do as an approach, and only you guys can fix that, not us. Okay, although we try, and that's important. So look at the kidney when you see things are progressing, and that's where it was in the 2009, you know, guidelines. Since then, we updated a few more minutes, and we're done. Uh, the last year, ACCNA, J, including Heart Failure Society, they updated their guidelines. They put lots more emphasis on the BNP as used as a uh, looking at patients who are risk of heart failure. If you have hypertension and diabetes, go and patient might be a little short, but even the echo looks normal, go ahead and order a BNP. If it's normal, we are okay. If it starts to be elevated, we know those patients will develop full blown heart failure, whether it's systolic or diastolic. That means you got to treat more aggressive risk factors. Same for diagnosis and same for prognosis. A BMP that stays high, even a usual at least half of what it was before discharge or initial, if it doesn't drop by at least 50%, those are patients more likely will come in the hospital. They were incompletely treated and you're sending them too early. And that's important to know. There is a caveat with BMP and diastolic heart failure and or hep pep. What's the caveat? The caveat is that uh, it it's under sensitive for somebody with diastolic heart failure. And in other words, if I were to look at the BMP of 500 for somebody with, with diastolic heart failure versus the one with systolic, I'll have to multiply by five to say, okay, well, a 500 uh, that, you know, in diastolic would be equivalent to 2,500 if this patient had, you know, systolic. Actually, that's what I do. The same with right side heart failure. And why is it under sensitive? Because look at this. There have been a lot of reasons why it's under sensitive, why it's lower. People said obesity causes. There's none of that. It's actually a very simple Laplace law, okay, that shows that the perceived world threat of the cardiac mice, which will resist PMP, is proportional with the pressure inside. So that'll be the blood pressure uh, or LVDP. The radius of the heart, you know, the bigger the heart, in inverse proportion with the wall thickness. Patients who have obesity, they have thicker heart, it grows, okay? And they have a um, smaller radius, or we call concentric hypertrophy. So because of that, even if you have the same blood pressure of 200 or 100, one release the same, you know, uh, BMP than the other. And this actually has been proven, all right? Systolic, diastolic, they look the same way. They look at systolic world stress and diastolic world stress. Even if the BMP were lower and correlated with less, and systolic and, all, and diastolic post stress. So just, I, I went through all that, just remember BMP is under sanity. Once I see going up, it's extremely prognostic, it's still bad, but a BMP of 200 for diastolic would be a BMP of 1,000 for systolic. This is a simple rule of thumb. And what is it BMP? It's think that is the hemoglobin-1C we have for heart failure, all right? You can have a, a glucose right now that's 120 is great, but the hemoglobin in 14, you know you're in trouble. That's chronic, uh, you know, not controlled, fully controlled in diabetes. And it's still silent. It still could be asymptomatic. Same with the PNP. I always say there is no such thing as asymptomatic elevated PNP. You just, that means you just then look around and dig closer to what's going on. If the patient is symptomatic, walk them again and, and figure that. Because everything we know about the BMP, it, it never lies except it's an undersensitive in patients with right side heart failure and, uh, and diastolic heart failure. That's all. All right. And at the end of the day, there are a couple of new things that came out. These are all different mechanisms that have been demonstrated in patients with, you know, diastolic heart failure or hep pef, but really the most important will be increased vascular and ventricular stiffening, you know, pulmonary hypertension. They try to target it with, you know, Revatio, uh, or, you know, uh, like medicines and, and or Viagra-like medicine, 
uh, although the initial studies were encouraging, the nitrates versus or value in these patients was neutral. You know, the RELAX HF study was negative, so forget about that. Uh, but one thing that seemed to pan out, we do have neurohormone activation just in the regular systolic heart failure, and targeting each of them se separately didn't make any difference. Here in blue, you see targeting them made a difference in patients with systolic heart failure, targeting uh, the this uh, neurohormone activation patients with HEPF didn't make any difference. It all crosses the one as ratio risk factor here. Uh, and I would say it's a little unfair because with systolic heart failure, we progressively added more and more. We kept the beta blocker, we added the ACE inhibitor, then we added our loss receptor antagonist. We actually don't have that study for HEPF. I think what we need to do to add all three of them or as long as the patient tolerate and then compare with conventional therapy or right, you know, treat the afterload, whatever we have right now. That study has yet to be done and, uh, and we do have some medicines that reduce the spiral act on the top cat trial. That's about uh, 30 to 45 milligrams of, of spironatone you know, daily. Um, and this is the phosphodiesterase inhibitor that I was telling you about. The rest really don't work except the spironolactone. And those patients have a creatinine less than, than two that you can follow closely. Uh, it's promising ahead, so to speak. Really, with close follow-up, they didn't have any risk of hyperkalemia. And actually, uh, AHA and ACC, and, uh, they have introduced it you know, as a the guidelines that in patients who are resistant, uh, they keep having congestion, that can help you with that too. One thing that's very fascinating, we have study where if you could fix, you got to fix the anemia. It's more important as a comorbid illnesses for this patient, particular iron deficiency anemia. Not the epogen or erythropoietin supplementation, I'm talking about be aggressive, send our study. If you fix that, they actually symptomatic improves, whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure. Don't have time to go. And sleep apnea, extremely important. Uh, and I'm, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. And yes. That's right, that's right. Well, uh, so first of all, grade one diastolic dysfunction, somebody who's 40, is highly abnormal. So it still helps just because they're not symptomatic. Also, 60 is still abnormal. That's an aged person. Uh, a, a normal stage one diagnosis on echo will be somebody 70 or older. Okay, so there is an age factor there that's it's appropriate. Second, you know, sometimes we get an echo to rule out other things, but it also tells you this is a patient who already has stage one. It's a great, he already has whatever the comorbid illnesses is already affecting the heart and can easily decompensate. You sure, if, uh, basically, if the patient's asymptomatic, there's no point of ordering the echo. If you got the echo and you see that, just judge, okay, if it's way younger than 70, I need to follow this patient closely and see what's their blockage, what other things are there. And that's how I see it, you know, uh, and yeah.